Hi, this is Phil from Shop Notes Magazine. Welcome to the Shop Notes Podcast. Today is episode number 156. I'm joined by Logan and John, and on today's episode, we're going to talk about some special uses for materials. There's a lot of materials, wood species, that in the past had a specific use attached to them. So we start with that, and then we riff on the topic of reusing, reclaiming, and rescuing material, whether it's from the burn pile, piece of firewood, an old tree in your yard, or buildings, and how we would go about using that. Today's episode is brought to you by Tight Bond. You want a glue that you can trust, and fortunately, Tight Bond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tight Bond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. And to start things off with a few comments from the last episode, which very shockingly, there were quite a number of people in support of the 30-minute podcast. So there you go. Uh, Let's see. James writes, I would love to see an article on how well Cerakote and Powder Coat compare to each other, how long they last, ease of application, pluses and minuses, etc. So there you go. Um, Michael writes, interesting that Logan is thinking about Cerakote for his restorations. I've given serious consideration to restoring my full set of Miller's Falls made Craftsman branded bench planes and having them Cerakoted as well. Uh, Jeff writes, on a serious note, being a life learner, I'll learn and try anything once. Sometimes it's the journey and sometimes it's the destination. Enriching experiences make for wisdom and wisdom makes for satisfaction with anything old or new. So there's our uh, wisdom of the ancients there. That's a good one. So, yeah. And then Terry writes, first of all, I completely enjoy your podcast, but to say they last too long, just don't ask Logan another question. (laughs) And there you have your 30 minute podcast. Yep. Just kidding. Logan, you guys are great to listen to. Wow. Kidding, not kidding. Kidding, not kidding. Rude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but fair. Like, I can't argue with it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So going back to the one comment there on Cerakote versus powder coat, in a nutshell, can you describe what each of those is and why they, why you would, why they're different? Yeah, so powder coating is literally that. Um, Powder, it's powdered paint, so it is a dry, I assume it's like a a print toner, which is what I'm more like technologically familiar with, which is a a toner molecule that is surrounded by wax. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that powder coating is along the same lines. I believe it has some form of metallic um, eh, maybe it's not metallic. Anyways, uh, it gets applied via static electricity. So the, the part is charged negatively. The powder, as it comes out of the spray again, is charged positively, and it attracts to it. Um, but then to cure, that has to go into the oven and bake. So there has to be some form of you know liquefying point for that powder to kind of homogenize and, and form a protective coating. Um, Cerakote's... Along the same lines, however, it is liquid in its native state. Some of it is air cure, some of it is bake cure. So there has to be, I'm guessing, some form of solvent that has to bake out that won't actually flash out unless you have the air dry one. Um, Application-wise, they're almost interchangeable from my understanding. From the research that I've done, um, seracoding and uh, uh, powder coating are basically the same thing um, with the application being a little different. You know, it takes some specialized equipment to do powder coating. You need an oven to bake your parts um, with the Cerakote. If you have the air dry, you don't need an oven. You can apply it with a standard spray gun with the correct size tip. Um, it, yeah, it's fr- from, again, this is all from my research. It is the most durable type of finish that you can put on metal. Um, either mm. powder coating or, um, let me rephrase that. Powder coating applied properly, or Cerakote, is about the most po- uh, the the most protective form of finish you can put on metal. 
Um, right. It sticks better than paint. Um, you can only anodize aluminum, I believe. So anodizing is kind of a separate beast. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, in a nutshell, they're, they're pretty much identical, but application and the actual process is a little different. Yeah. So these That's are both. One... Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say these are both things that people can. Most people can do at home with the right tools and a the large enough oven. The Cerakote, yes. Um, powder coating, you do need to be able to. I think charge the parts statically. So like if yeah, you go into car like, battery, I mean, yeah, so, up to a car battery. So like if you, right? <laughs> yes, I think I think that's how you do it. <laughs> Portable car charger. Yes. Yeah. All of our listeners that are electricians. You can reach John Doyle. At <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you just need is an old microwave, <laughs> <laughs> a transformer. Yeah. Um, yes, I believe with the, yeah, with the right size stuff, and I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that Harbor Freight actually sells a powder coating kit. I. I don't know. Long what ago, it, when Sears was a thing, they had sent us a powder coating kit. I remember that. So, yeah, I remember yeah. It, it coming up like as we're digging through stuff. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, you know, I think for all intents and purposes, they're pretty much the same. Okay. So Ceracote, uh, it feels like there's the name ceramic in there. Is that part of the deal, or is that I, just a name? I think so. I don't know how much if there is any ceramic in it. I I agree. I feel like there is some form of ceramic in it because um, the only thing I've really ever felt ceracoting on is like uh, I felt it on firearms because um, it's pretty big in like the the handgun industry, um, and I've also felt it on like utility items like knives and stuff. Um, okay. And it does. It has kind of a slippery type finish. I actually, I have the samples I purchased here. Um, I'll have to bring them in so you guys can feel them. It's a little different. It, it definitely has some form of texture to it. Um, and they're not gloss. Like with powder coating, you can get gloss and I'm pretty sure you can get matte too. I think all the Cerakote stuff is pretty much matte. Um, which, okay. What that means for woodworking machinery in a wood shop, I don't know. I I feel like gloss cleans up a little bit easier. Like it, pow, uh, you know, sawdust doesn't stick to it. It doesn't look as dirty mm -hmm. if you touch it with you know dusty fingers. Right. Um. But yeah. does that really matter? Probably not. Yeah. It feels like in a woodworking shop, if something's matte black and it gets dusty, it's just always going to be dusty. That's like you can never <laughs> get it clean. Yeah. <clears throat> right. That's true. Yeah. Also, there was an, another comment from last week's episode. We were talking about different things. Oh, the subject of chip carving came up, mm -hmm. if you'll remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our production team, Nate, uh, sent me a comment. And Nate's one of those guys that, um, if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings, he's like one of the Rangers of the North, kind of one of these behind the scenes guys that does his job in a way that we don't know that he's there, but if he weren't there, it would all fall apart. Yep. I think that's a fair way of describing Nate. Yeah. Part, of, so. part of the gray company. Mm -hmm. So he had suggested that one use of uh, chip carving to kind of dive deep on is uh for making woodblock prints mm -hmm. which i thought was kind of a cool idea and i had actually done a woodblock as a part of a christmas gift last year and then he sent nate sent me a link to a guy that he met in japan that does really cool woodblock so i'm going to put a a link to that guy's youtube channel his name's david bull and he goes by the handle that I'm going to totally hose up the pronunciation of like Cesaragi Studio, maybe. So, and speaking of Lord of the Rings, David Bull's photo on his channel has definitely a Gandalf sort of look to it. So, full disclosure. Anyway, so there's... And I've always thought of 
coming up with projects for Woodsmith, and I'm sure you think of it too for popular woodworking, is what are other things that you can do with woodworking that creates practical, functional pieces of wood, I guess, products mm -hmm. with wood? Is that a fair way of describing it? Yeah. You know, that, that are maybe beyond furniture. Yeah, like like for example, I for a while I've wanted to build an easel, like an art easel, right? So the type of thing you're talking about, where it's like, yeah, yes. it's a woodworking project, but you use it for something else, mm -hmm. or right. like our our cooking utensils we just did for the TV show, for the TV show, yeah. yeah, 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 or you know, like the game that table skittles game that we did, where yeah. it's, you know, it's a it's definitely a woodworking project, but it does more than just kind of occupy space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not just, it's not sculptural either, you know, where it's specifically mm -hmm. meant for being an art Looking piece, at, yeah. which, which I guess isn't, I'm not opposed to, but I think that's in some sense, a different field of what we do for Woodsmith. Mm -hmm. So, and it's kind of fun too, like to do woodblock carving and then to print with it. Like it's mm -hmm. amazing. It's also amazing to me how fine a detail some folk can get on a woodblock print. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you were going to say, okay, I'm going to do a woodblock print. Are you using basswood? I did. Okay. Because. Ease of carving because of ease of carving and you know you have people do uh, so nate was inspired by this guy so mm -hmm. he's done some linoleum printing oh yeah yeah you know and that's the whole thing with linoleum is that you can get crisp detail but the linoleum cuts a lot easier than wood does you don't have to deal with grain direction blah 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 that was part of the reason that i did basswood too is that I didn't want to have to fight grain direction a lot, but I will say that in some of my research on looking up about woodblock printing, which kind of gets a little muddy with engraving mm -hmm. is some of the engravers are using end grain beach and they're doing their engraving on that, which Interesting. to me, I would love to see somebody do that live to be able to ask a bunch of questions because to me, it's like, I would just tear the snot out of it. <laughs> it would. Do you think that's because those ingrain fibers kind of act like paintbrush bristles and soak up ink and you can get multiple prints off of one, one application or why I guess possibly I think homogenous like the homogenous surface. Yeah, because they were doing engraving, like wood, like illustration engravings for, you know, that it's an old style from the medieval period, kind of. Sure. That you would do those engravings on that. And then they were doing it both as the block print style, and then it's kissing cousin, and I'm going to butcher it because I don't remember. It's an Italian word. It's like intaglio or intaglio mm -hmm. or however you want to say it. Intarsia, I believe it's pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> So like a typical <laughs> Did I get that right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. yes. I, I am it. never gonna live that down. It's gonna be nope. in addition to being the short one on the T V show, yeah. it's gonna be Oh, you're the Intarja hater. Yeah. That's right. So woodblock printing typically is where you put ink on the uncarved surfaces, press it in, take it off, that's your image. In Talio is you put ink on it and you rub it off so that the ink is now sitting within the carved surface. It's a positive and versus then, a negative print. Yeah. And then you yeah. use extreme pressure to get the ink from those reservoirs mm -hmm. onto the paper. Yeah. That's my very lame sure. summary of what it is. In any case, I was just kind of surprised that they were using end grain. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, and I asked about basswood because, I mean, I've, I've done some carving of basswood. Not, like, chip carving, but, like, 
you know, 18th century style, you know, shells and stuff. Um, yeah. Basswood can be fuzzy. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like and with I've sharp tools. That. Yeah. With sharp tools, you can get it smooth. But for those of us laymen that are not, you know, Al breed, it can be fuzzy. So I was wondering if something like Tupelo would be better. Maybe. Um, I've, I've never worked with Tupelo. Um, I know power carvers love it cause it does not fuzz. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that would cut nicer. Um, I have, I've done some block printing, um, in college and we, <laughs> I feel like we cheated cause we used thick printing press blankets, which the blanket cylinders are basically a, you know, three millimeter thick rubber that's meant to transfer ink from the plate to the paper. So it's right. like, that's what it's made for. And yeah. it co- it's rubber. So it carves, you know, it's not linoleum by any means, but yeah. Huh. So I've never heard of using end grain, but that, that's interesting. It would be a homogenous surface, I guess. Yeah. You know, I mean, other than gluing up, you know, you'd, you'd have to have, either pretty big pieces of beach, you know, or you're gluing up blocks, but then they were also making, you know, some of those wood block prints aren't very large to begin with, you know, they're, or made up of a series, but it was just kind of a fun, fun idea and reminded, you know, Nate reminded me of that. So I've always been uh, a fan of, you know, and these are kind of, know the shabby chic thing but i've seen where they do like a a block print of just end grain of a log you seen that yes Mm yeah that would be kind of fun like i don't know would you would you cut that and plain it smooth and then do it or would you cut it and then use like a wire brush in a angle grinder to get some texture Mm -hmm. yeah could because just i think that might work better i don't know it might just depend on the species of wood yeah, too and how would. open the grain is yeah. to start with or yeah. but take some experimenting mm-hmm. not something i want to try but it just is interesting yeah right so from your engineering background john did you have any interesting wood product <laughs> applications that you remember i don't know we're pretty boring we don't get too we don't get too artsy i guess you know yeah i'm trying to think if there's anything odd but nothing that really sticks out i guess okay so you know what i've always found fascinating is that some different species are very very particularly used for certain applications like i mean obviously basswood is used for for carving um you know i've i've used it for drawer boxes it works beautifully um but something like lignum vitae like the the og the original lignum vitae not this argentina kid that tries to sneak in there um <laughs> the the true lignum vitae was mainly used in ship bearings which i think is fascinating Right. You know, like like propeller shaft bearings because it's water resistant and it's self lubricating, which is super cool to me. I have a couple mm-hmm. of small pieces that I got from England um, that are maybe, I don't know, two inches of diameter and six inches long. And I'm thinking, you know, I might make some bandsaw mill guides out of them once my ceramics wear out. Because I know oh, people use go. lignum for that too. So I, mm-hmm. that oh, type of cool. stuff is super fascinating me yeah we're specific yeah you're right that specific wood species had a had a function and a job and mm-hmm. and that's just because they were so oil like it's very oily, oily wood yeah and yeah. they're dense yeah 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 it's yeah. Like, i mean it is i believe the densest wood um in the world uh and it's the only wood i know that sinks in water uh, which is how i kind of figured out that these were lignum as i threw them in I threw them in my kitchen sink and they sunk. <laughs> um, they were they were sold as lignum, but the entire box was sold as lignum, and I know half of the stuff in the box is not lignum. I mm-hmm. mean, it, you know, it, yeah. it it looks like rosewood, which is cool too. But right, you know, it's you know same way that um, and I don't know. I've heard that this is a myth, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, I believe it is hornbeam. Is it hornbeam? I think it was hornbeam that or maybe it's holly i think it's hornbeam um 
that in England, where all the weaving factories were, they're making the uh, the shuttlecocks, right? That would would go back and forth on the looms, and the story goes that they would buy, um, they would buy the hornbeam blanks cut to a certain size, and then they would put them in a hydraulic press over like a twenty four or forty eight hour period. Because I guess hornbeam is one of those woods that will actually compress significantly and retain that shape. Oh, so they would like basically super condense these these hornbeam blanks. I, um, I, the first person I heard talk about this was uh, Stuart Batty. He's a Turner because um, he worked in the wood industry over in England before he came to the states. Um, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to it, but it, just interesting to me that you know that's what it was used for. I mean, it's kind of the same way we use you know white oak now for barrel staves. Um, right, which is the main industry for white oak right now. Um, There's just those type of applications are fascinating to me. Where it's like, hey, we use this because of this reason. It's like, oh, super cool. Yeah, it's fun to see. So there you are, folk tales about the uses of wood. So if you have any special stories that you remember, that would be really cool because I've heard. Uh, you know, like using teak on ship decks, stuff yeah. like that, you know, especially doing some tours of Navy ships where they would have the decking is made out of teak or that kind of thing. That's why the uh, U.S. is still, you know, $8 trillion in debt for buying all that teak. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about That's, the teak futures, though. It's right, going to go up. True. Yeah. It's true. Get the ROI on it. Mm-hmm. Yep. We have a teak repository. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, uh, who was it was telling me there was a bunch of Cuban mahogany up in um, Wisconsin, maybe, that was sent up there before World War One for, I think, airplane propellers. Really? Was the, yeah. And there was like, there was like, you know what it was? It was actually a Wood Talk episode. Um, uh, the guys on Wood Talk, uh, Mark Spagnolo, Matt Cronin, and uh, Shannon Rogers. I think Shannon, because he's in the lumber industry, he was talking about that. And I'm pretty sure that's what it was. It was, it was like a, <laughs> this repository of stashed away, government-owned <laughs> Cuban mahogany mm-hmm. for airplane, airplane propellers, but it never got used. So somehow it got cracked open, and I don't know. It was, it was fascinating. Hmm. All right. There you go. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I remember not long ago there was uh, an article about old grain silos that were on the piers of, I think it was Lake Superior, that they were taking apart. And they were all, like all old white pine, but they were, it was basically face nailed, laminated kind of construction to create yeah. these uh, grain elevators and storage containers for shipping grain, you know, transferring it from shore to ships for for shipping and how they were starting to take those apart and figuring out ways that they could reuse that that material for something. Yeah. And just crazy how big the boards were that were coming out of there. Yeah. You know, well, it's like what it took to nail those together. Yeah. Well, it's like, I mean, so this weekend I walked um, a property with my buddy, Sean. Um, he's helping this this farmer. I hate to see this, but living in the Midwest, we see this all the time where timbers tore out for farmland. Right. And I mean, so this farmer is tearing out this, I don't know, 80 acres of timber um, just so he can get, you know, an extra 80 acres of crop. I mean, I get it. You know, that's how we feed the world. Um, so we're walking through. We, we, we actually cut a bunch of cherry logs to size. Um, and we also marked probably, God, I only marked half of them. I don't think, think I marked that many. These white pines that were in there. And they're huge. They're so big. Like, they're 40 inches in diameter. Like, they're big. Aww. I know. So I marked them all to save the logs because the guys what the guy's doing is he's coming in with a backhoe and he's doing a scoop on each side of the root ball and then just pushing the tree over because or an excavator not a backhoe it's it's a big excavator um because then he doesn't have to worry about the stumps and he can just till right through it right Mm -hmm. 
Um, but like those trees, I don't know. The rest of the timber was pretty young, just judging by the size of the trees in there. There wasn't any real big oaks in there because it just wasn't that mature of a timber. The, the, there was a couple good sized cherries in there. Um, a lot of them had died off. So it tells me that timber's probably 50 years old or so. Okay. So these yeah. pines that are 40 inches are probably 50 years old, which means there's going to be a, some great big old growth rings in there. I don't know that for sure. We won't know until we cut them. Um, but yeah, like just thinking about the old growth white pine that they would have you know made those silos out of, or the fur that you know John used in that in that table that mm-hmm. that he did yeah. that um, you know farmhouse table, like those trees would have been massive. And then how did they? I mean, just seeing somebody saw them back then would have been interesting because a lot of those old circular mills they'll only do a twenty eight inch cut, and some of those boards are much bigger than that. And some right. of those logs are much bigger than that. Like, how did you manage that? Yeah. A- aliens. That's help from, <laughs> yes. Help from the aliens. Yes. <laughs> yes. They positioned the log with the Great Pyramid tips. And, yep. you know. Yep. Yeah. 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 Probably. Today's podcast is brought to you by Tight Bond. You want a glue that you can trust. And fortunately, Tight Bond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. Which is interesting that there are white pines down there because one does not normally associate white pine with Iowa. No, these are over by Winterset. Yeah, so southern South, half of yeah. Iowa. Yeah, so why? Yeah. <laughs> Don't know. Mm-hmm. They're in the middle of the timber. Right. So. Unless well, it was, I, was long ago line. that somebody tried to start something. Yeah, yeah, it's actually along the fence line right now. So I wonder if it was tree. a windbreak, maybe. Christmas tree farm. Christmas tree farm, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Because there's a, just north of Des Moines is one of the county parks, Jester Park, has a stand of, they're not white pines. I don't know if they're like red, red pine, pines or something like Scotch that. pine maybe. Yeah. yeah. That was, it's really cool to walk through because you get inside of it. They have part of the hiking trails through there and you get the pine needles on the, on the trail. So it's real it's quiet. Open. Mm-hmm. And it's open. Everything's dead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But they, those were all planted by the former, you know, before it turned into a county park, you know, it was a landowner and they had put a big stand of those pines in there for, cause they liked them or a windbreak or whatever. And mm-hmm. I think it's really cool. But yeah. Yeah. now is, I know I, I, I kind of have a notion of Phil's answer to this. Is it worth, in your guys' opinion, if they're tearing apart the silos or, you know, whatever, they're tearing apart, is it worth trying to reclaim some of that material and reuse it? Like, is that something you shy, you guys shy away from in your shop? Would you guys prefer just to get new material or reuse it? Or I, what do you guys think? It just opinions? depends always, or it comes down to what's your time worth? Like, <laughs> right. how much time do you want to spend? Like, if you have unlimited time, yeah. But if you have to you know, get stuff done quickly. It's always easier to go with the new stuff, but I don't know. Like you were mentioning that farmhouse table that did uh, a few years ago. And I mean, it was pretty like, it was all cleaned up and like it, you know, the surface aging and patina off of it. And they look brand new on the inside. It was, it was amazing. And then, you know, all that stuff's old growth and you can't really get that anymore. And so I don't know. Yeah, it kind of just depends, I guess, how much time you have and 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 the look you're going for. So right, because I had gotten a bunch of basswood and walnut from a coworker who had pulled it out of an f- old farmhouse that was used in like the it was all like casing and trim work in the farmhouse, and uh, and I built a tool chest out of the walnut. And it was fun to work with because it was all old air dried walnut. 
had awesome color to it. There were quite a few nail holes in it. And that was part of the appeal to me was that it had that character with it. But all the walnut, all the basswood was just caked in like 45 layers of paint, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And because of that, there were a bunch of nails still in it. Like a lot of them were old cut nails. And I ended up, you know, you'd be, I was resawing it here at work because I didn't have a bandsaw big enough at the time. And you'd be going along and all of a sudden you'd hear that like zinc. And it's like, yeah, these next cuts aren't going to be as clean. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the cut nails were nice because they weren't super hard. So it wasn't as bad, but you could, it's still not good for the the blade. And it just took a lot to get through the, the paint. And it's like, what do you, what are you doing with the paint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of times I just resaw the outside face, you know, because the back face of it wasn't painted, obviously. Mm-hmm. So you just kind of resaw to get close to your thickness and then send it through the planer. And then you just got, you know, an eighth or a quarter of an inch that had the paint layer on. I scraped off a bunch of the paint and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So I like re- reusing stuff like that, but it really, for me, it comes down to is it worth it to deal with paint if there's the, if it's there or fasteners or a bunch of nail holes because over time you know there's a bunch of corrosion that happens around those fasteners mm-hmm. so it's not like a clean hole it's going to leave a Oblong. a darkened stained you know, blemish in the material. So, yeah. so what are you going to do with it? Like this, like those grain elevators, they were taking them apart and they had been nailed together. And I think it would be cool to reuse, but I would want to reuse it probably in construction. Got it. You know, like I were building my own shop as a separate building and you could reuse it as a structural member. Then sure. you'd have that as a, you know, then it would be reused that way. Yeah. See, I'm not I a guess... he- oh. Oh, good. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of reusing something and keeping the original patina or surface on it. You know, like for that dining table, we, on the top face, you know, we cleaned it with like a wire brush and whatever, but it's still got that textured weathered surface to it Mm -hmm. and it ended up looking really cool it's just not my deal i would i would much prefer to still reuse it but then plane it down so i had a clean Mm -hmm. flat surface on it Mm yeah i was gonna say that's like the stuff i have reclaimed i think we talked maybe we talked a couple weeks ago about the bowling alley that i used for my bench top which is a terrible idea like i will never do that again (laughs) Yeah. Um, but like I did, I, I saved a bunch of redwood. Um, my brother brought me some and I saved a bunch of redwood out of, you know, school here in town. And I don't, I don't mess with the holes. Like if there's holes in it, I don't use it. But if it's decent enough material, like that redwood was really nice, really old growth. It's all quarter sawn stuff for the most part. It's like I can get 18 inch long pieces out of it and then just right. saw it. And that's, to me, it's like if I can get decent material with the least amount of work, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's like, so those were big, you know, four by four or six by sixes. So it's just like, hey, clean off one face and then just resaw it. Just, right. just slice it into whatever, you know, sandwich slices you want. Um, and that's what I did. Um, the same thing with some of the fur. Like Dylan had some of that um, uh, fur that I don't remember what it was one of Dylan. Yeah. It was, it there's was some, one of the there's some beams, I think, from an old bar. Yeah. Or something, and he was reusing yeah. it for something. Yeah, I don't and it's one like, of his projects. Like those, I would use. I cut off. I cut off whatever fastener holes there are, and then just resaw those, so I'd have some decent material. Yeah. But if it's like one inch, you know, one by sixes that are, I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to mess with that because I don't want to clean off uh, paint. You know, I don't want to worry about nails. Um, I, I do understand that, you know, 
my situation having a mill is a little different um, where some people be like, you know what? I, I see that as free material and I could save that money. That's awesome. I just right. don't have mm-hmm. the time to mess with it. Yeah. Um, or if it's like, if it's a material that is super rare, um, super rare, you know, if it's something that's hard to get a hold of, if it's like, you know, ebony or, um, you know, these, these pieces of lignum vitae that I mentioned earlier, um, they were, I believe, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that what they were, but they're almost like plumber's tools. They're, they're conical shaped. Um, so they're almost like plumber's tools for doing, or maybe like a HVAC tool for doing like tin work to make a flange is almost oh, okay. what they appear to be. And I don't yeah. know that for sure, but that's kind of what I expect that they were because um, they're all different sizes, um, all with about the same taper on them. Like, I will mess with that, absolutely, because I you can't buy true lignum vitae anymore unless you get it from, you know, lawn bowls. That's another example. You know, there's lawn bowls sitting in the closet, you know, over by Phil um, that I bought because they're lignum vitae. Um, like, that type of thing I will mess with. Um, but, again, it's the time versus what I'm going to use it for. You know, they're, these are all basically turning pieces at this point, so it's like I chuck them on the lathe. I don't have any cleanup to do on them, really. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. But if somebody was like, hey, I got walnut, you know, baseboard in my house, do you want it? <laughs> nope. I don't. Yeah. Because you can get walnut anywhere. So yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, John's point is exactly it, though. It's how much is your time worth? Mm-hmm. And the corollary to that is maybe having an idea of what you're going to do with it beforehand yes. but just yeah. in order to create a stockpile of material you're always going to find in your stockpile something that's easier to mm-hmm. work with yes uh, i also i guess look at it as you know you're reclaiming it super great because it's better than it getting burned or mulched or mm-hmm. or whatever so yes there's that but then also look at it is fundamentally there's no difference between reclaiming something from a a usability perspective than if you're pulling something out of a firewood pile if it's short lengths or yep. if you're dealing with rough sawn boards Correct. so Correct. you know if you're resawing something or you're reclaiming something, don't view it as buying boards from a har, you know, from a lumber yard or a home center. It's more like buying rough sawn lumber from Logan. Yes. And that you're there's going to be some stuff. Yep. You're cutting around stuff and you, it's going to require, and this all feeds into John's time question of planning around what's going on on those pieces. Yes. Whether it's, you know, rot and defects or a weathered surface or fastener mm-hmm. holes or, or whatever. So, yep. That's, yeah. that's a great way to put it. Um, yeah. I could see too, if there was like sentimental value, like if it was walnut baseboards from my grandpa's old farm, that's getting torn down and I want to, you know, build some boxes out of it yeah, to give yes. to family or something like that, that, you know, might be worth the time to, yeah. To, to go through it that way or whatnot so yeah my my mom grew up on a dairy farm in wisconsin and after my grandparents passed they ended up selling the farm and then uh there weren't animals in the barn anymore so the barn starts to deteriorate pretty quickly once there aren't any livestock in there and so i don't know if it has been torn down yet but was going to get torn down and it would have been cool because you know in something like an old dairy barn there are some pretty large timbers in there yeah Mm -hmm. you know and you know some places you're going to have to work around fasteners totally get that but it would have been cool to have a piece of some of those timbers to do something with Mm -hmm. you know just to make something with it from a sentimental value you know outside of me is anybody else going to attach value to it? Eh, not necessarily. Yeah. But the fact that it came from somewhere and moves along into another set of usefulness would be kind of cool. Yeah. 
You know, I've I have I have almost bought. There's been a couple of times where I've been wandering around flea markets here or antique stores, and you see the you see the poorly done like burl tables and stuff. You know, like where it's, yeah. it's almost like the old cypress tables where they just slice it and put it on a cypress knee, kind of <laughs> like that, but a burl. And there's been a couple times where I've looked at it and been like, you know, like if that burl didn't have epoxy all over top of it, like I'd pay, I'd I'd pay that price for that burl. So it's like, you know, should I just buy it? I don't know. You know, it's <laughs> I have not. I'm I'm making growth as an individual, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I have not. But uh, I don't know. I just. It, it is an interesting dance between your time and your your materials and your money and what what you, you know what direction you want to take it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is a fascinating discussion to have because you know if you're just getting into woodworking, there is a steep price to pay in terms of buying tools mm-hmm. and then buying materials. And, you know, depending on your stage of life, there's probably not a lot of disposable income to be thrown at that. So if you can save money, quote, on materials, then, yeah, it's kind of fun to do. And I did that here a lot with, you know, one of the strange things about working at a woodworking magazine is how much wood gets dispersed to people who have wood burning stoves you know and you're like that can all be used for something (laughs) sometimes it's better to let it go and sometimes you just need somebody older than you to be like yes but for what Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know it can be used for heat to survive yeah and it's just you know it so it's end up like are you do you really have a plan for that rather than just its potential because like every piece of wood has potential Mm-hmm. But is that the kind of thing that you want to make? You yeah. know, just because it's free and you, you know, it's like all these pieces of really cool white oak could be some awesome boxes. Yep, they can. Do you want to make a bunch of white oak boxes? Yep. And is that, you know, what would you do with them? Yeah. If you can answer those questions, bang sure on, so. go at it yep. mm-hmm. and pick it up. But yeah. if not, move it along to the universe. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because like I have this, I have the same argument with my tree guys. Um, you know, like this weekend when I was walking through with Sean, we were, there's much trees already down. We cut, we bucked the ones we wanted to link and he's like trying to buck everything. I'm like, no, no, like don't <laughs> mess with that one. Why? It's a good cherry. I'm like, I, there's too many logs here. We're cherry picking the best ones. Like, I don't want to mess with the one that looks like a corkscrew, you know, like if it looks like a wine bottle opener, Mm -hmm. like I don't want it. It's probably got an amazing figure though. Yeah, it might. And that's great. (laughs) It's going to look really good in somebody's wood burning stove. Yeah. Or, you know, the, the other thing that I have thought about and it, it all comes down to a time versus what's my time worth is I really, and I think I've mentioned it before. I would really like to get a flooring machine, a four headed molder. Okay. To, to like, I'm thinking it's funny. Cause I had this discussion with Matt Corona a couple of weeks ago on the phone. Cause he's, he's right now doing Oak floors for his addition on his house. And I'm like, I was kind of talking to him about the, the machine he was using. And he's like, you know, he's like, honestly, with my time, I would have been better off just buying the floor. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> that's what I needed to hear because yeah. it's like, yeah, I got the lumber. Yes. It's sawn. Do I have the time to stand there and run it through a molder? I still would like to buy one. So maybe I know my buddy Bobby's going to listen to this. Bobby, we need to buy a molder. <laughs> so then because you're retired, you can run it. <laughs> so. But yeah. Yeah. It'll so all no. happen when I retire. There you go. Yep. Then your whole life becomes just one endless series of side hustles. It's true. <laughs> it's funny because anytime I talk to, and I'm sure some of our listeners will either deny or confirm this. I have heard that from most people, they are m- more busy after they retire than they were when they had a working career. 
Because, like, I hear a lot of people say, you know what? I thought I was going to have a lot of time when I retired. I don't have time for anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or maybe they're just fed up with it, and they just say they don't have time for anything. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So. Yeah. My mom calls a lot of those guys Romeos. Mm-hmm. Where it's retired old men eating out. Yeah. 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 Yep. So, there you go. So, I would love to hear rescue stories from listeners. If you want to put those in the comments on our YouTube channel or send us an email, uh, woodsmith at woodsmith.com about maybe a special piece that you've made from something that's recycled or rescued or whatever that, uh, and it could be anything. Did it come from an old building or a farm building or something with, you know, maybe a tree that got taken down in your childhood home backyard or a firewood rescue that really turned out something cool. Uh, I would love to hear that. Um, Or like I said earlier, any stories that you've heard about how X species of wood was always used for this, you know, bring it on. That would be something cool to, to share with everybody here. Um, And the free project for this episode is going to be a mystery one because I have not selected it yet. So grab bag. It will be, yeah, it'll be a surprise. It's a mystery (laughs) box of plan. Whichever so, plan is overstocked right now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, Sometimes the PDFs just pile up too high yep. and we got to <laughs> liquidate. Yeah. I will point out, we had zero applications to the great red cedar throwdown of 2023. Yeah. Yep. Nobody wants that smoke. No. Somebody, <laughs> somebody uh, sent in about using it for the handles on fishing rods. Yes, which is and okay. I'm cool with that. That's cool. I'm cool with that. But then there, it's it's an accent piece, so that's where we're. Yep. The thing, and we're gonna re refresh it. Like the red cedar challenge is ongoing. It's kind of like the X Prize of right. of wood of woodsmith shop notes and popular woodworking is find yep. us a solid a example. Yep. <laughs> and you gotta you gotta meet are three criteria for what that thing looks like. So mm-hmm. even if you have to build that project right now and you're <laughs> going to do it out of rage and spite <laughs> just to rescue we the reputation those. of red yep. cedar, bring it on. That's what we want. So, uh, and I think feels like it just fits right in with today's episode too. That's right. So if you want to do that, I would love to do hear from you. Special thanks to tight bond who create the glues that bind any rescued material, all the recycled, reclaimed, reused lumber projects. They'll glue them together. That's what tight bond glues are for. Uh, Check it out at tightbond.com. So thanks for listening, everybody, to the Shop Notes podcast, and we'll see you next week.